Hi everyone, um, welcome to this webinar today on the mid block. Um, we're looking at the when, the why and the how of a mid block. Uh, really, really excited and grateful to be joined by Hope Powell. Um, I feel like I shouldn't really be introducing you Hope because people should already know um, what you've achieved in the game and what you've done in the game. Um, but just to kind of talk through some of the achievements that Hope has, Hope has done over the years. So former international player, um, two-time FA Cup winner, uh, winning the double uh, league, and, league and Cup double in 1996 with Croydon, where she was captain. I believe you scored a couple of goals in the final of the FA Cup that year as well. I think so. Um, can't remember, too long ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, UEFA Pro licence. Um, and then in 2017, after managing uh, the England team for a number of years, um, you moved on to WSL football with Brighton um, just before they kind of went fully professional in terms of the WFL league. So really amazing, like wealth of experience to draw upon in the women's game and to relate that back down to the mid block um, and I guess out of possession principles. Um, so joining me as well today is Warren, Warren Hackett, who's a youth coach developer in the pro game. Warren is also an ex-player and lots of coaching experience as well. Um, so it'd be good to, for me and Warren to start to ask some really good questions for Hope. Um, to help the coaches who are listening to this call. I'm a women's national coach developer um, in the pro game. So I kind of work with um, different uh, women's teams and coaches um, from WSL and in, into RTCs as well. So, yeah, coaches listening, let's try and relate it back down to our coaching practice and the players that you work with as much as possible on this call. So, Hope. Um, I guess we want to kick it off really by kind of being um, a little bit inquisitive about your your background. So as a coach, so over the years, the first question we kind of want to establish is what's changed for you? Because you coach for a number of years. So what have you noticed that's been different in your coaching practice? Um, yeah, I, I think um, from where I started to where it where I am now in terms of, of, of coaching, I think, um, you know, giving a little bit more ownership to, to players, um, engaging them in, in the outcomes of the practice and what we want to achieve um, and, and almost letting them in, in some way lead it and, and have that, I don't know, the ownership that then transfers to, to the pitch. So when I first started, it, 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 it felt more about the coach and less about the players. And now I think it's kind of really flipped. It is all about the players and, and the, the coach is there just to, to facilitate learning, really. Love that. Um, is there any differences as well um, between managing the national team and managing a club team? Oh, absolutely. Huge differences. I think, first and foremost, when you're with the national team, you, you really just loan the players I mean, you have them for a short period of time and then you, you, you hand them back. So most of the learning, I would argue, is done in the clubs. They have more time day to day. Um, and certainly now I'm in a club, you know, seeing the development of a player day to day, you really, as a coach, you have a massive influence and a massive impact. Um, I actually, you know, the adjustment from international to domestic was quite a challenge for me because I felt like I was in, a constant tournament domestically you know the games are relentless you you turn them around you have to prepare for the next one um, whereas internationally the the longest you might be away with with the squad is probably six weeks and then at the end of it you know you've got some respite whereas a club coach it is you're in a constant tournament for for nine ten months of the year and yeah. that is a major difference for, for me what about um, in respect of building relationships, Hope? Obviously, it's really difficult in a limited time that you've got to build relationships with your players. How did you overcome that? Yeah, I think um, certainly, as I said, internationally, it's a snapshot. You have them, you send them back, and it takes a longer, many years to really get to know the player. Whereas in a club, being with them every day, you, 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 you build, you have to build those relationships very quickly, understand you know, who they are as people and not just who they are as, as, as players and understand really what makes them them tick so that you can obviously get the best out of them. Yeah. Internationally, that's a lot more challenging. Right. Okay. 
so I guess we're gonna um <laughs> that was strange. <laughs> Sensor. So I've got to move around a bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, we're gonna move on now to some of the uh, the outcomes for the webinar. So for the people listening, these are the, the areas we really want to try and focus on with with hope as we get into our conversation around the mid block. Um, so I'm not needing to read it, read it out word by word, um, but really succinctly, it's kind of this idea of trends in the game, um, particularly trends in create the attack, because we realise that's really important to recognise when we're talking about defending in the middle third. Um, we want to kind of establish why, uh, when and why we might use a mid block um, and how it could look slightly different depending on who you're playing against. Um, and then also, how do you coach it um, on and off field? What's the types of... Um, types of stuff you might do with your players to, to develop their understanding and confidence in this area. Okay, so just a question just around that hope. So with your current players, uh, what type of influence do they have on the way you want to set up? Um, I guess what I do is I, I, I this, this is the game plan. This is, this is um, what we're intending to do based on the knowledge of the opposition. Um, and you know you kind of hope you get the players buy in and if they're unsure they they ask questions around it um you, you know one of the things i always kind of say is you know are we comfortable with that do we agree with that i think it's really important that that players buy into the philosophy of, of what you're trying to to achieve um and then once that that if there, there's agreement and questions are asked then we obviously try and put it into practice on the pitch yeah all the while, um, you know, I'm really happy for the players to, to challenge it. For me, it's really important that the, the players are comfortable with the game plan. Mm. You know, if they're comfortable, they're more likely to deliver it. If they're not, then I hope that they ask questions and I give them the freedom to ask the question. You know, are you comfortable with that? Are there any questions? You know, what do you think? Does that, you know, I'm, I'm very conscious of them being part of the plan. So so I'll perhaps come up with the plan. This is what we're gonna do. Are you comfortable doing it? Because if they're not, then we have to work around that. You know, ascertain why they're perhaps not, and then work around that. And, and quite often, you know, I'm happy to, to, you know, go with some of their ideas. I think that's really important because at the end of the day, the players are the ones that need to execute it on the pitch. But more often than not, you know, they want the plan, they want it. But yeah. for me, they absolutely have to be comfortable in trying to execute it. I suppose if they see you being open and see, you know, see that you're actually listening to them at times, there's a bigger buy-in, isn't there? It isn't kind of always your way. You're yeah. flexible enough to say, well, you know what? I agree with that today. You know, let's go with that. So you're going yeah. to get, get a bigger buy-in, obviously, long-term, aren't you? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, you know, while while my job is to lead it and present it, um, and they need that. You know, the, the 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 players want some guidance, which I think is really important. Um, and then with that guidance, I want them to have the freedom to to challenge it. You know, it's not to say that I agree with them. I wouldn't want them to always yeah. agree with me, but for them to explore it and challenge it, I think is really important for their learning and their development. Okay, so, Hope, where you, where you joined the team in 2017 at Brighton, um, you've obviously been there a few seasons now. So, is is there a kind of way in which you would defend anyway? Like, no matter who you're playing against, some some sort of, uh, I guess, non-negotiables that you would expect to see out of possession? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's, and with all due respect, I think that when I first came into Brighton, they were playing in what we would call the championship now, WSL2. Um, a lot of the players were, you know, part-time. It was a hobby um, and, and very quickly had to change the mindset from part-time to full-time and not perhaps having as much as experience of, as other teams in the league. So very quickly I had to really lay a, a, a baseline principle of, of how we were going to set up. You know, we're always going to do this. We're going to try and be hard to beat. We're going to have a, you know, a steady back four, as it were, a, a real foundation to build on. And just so that they could get the structures right, the, uh, 
I think one of the things, do the basics well. Certainly when you're out of possession, I think one of my main philosophies is be hard to beat. Now, what that looks like will depend on the team that we're obviously playing against. Um, that is my fundamental, be hard to beat. I think it gives you the best chance of, of getting anything out of the game. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Hope. Um, so, yeah, we're moving on now a little bit to the opposition, which Warren's going to talk around um, just now. Got the next slide. Yeah, so opposition considerations. Um, so we're, we're now really looking at kind of the create the attack from the opposition. Uh, yeah. And go on, go on, Warren. Sorry, sorry, Amy. So, yeah, look, talking about, you know, we're talking about mid block, but we need to think about obviously the create and attack part of it and the things that you're potentially going to come up against and what you'd expect to see. So, current, you know, I would say in a mid block, you're pr pretty much, you know, you're looking to stop penetration. So, in creating the attack, you're looking to penetrate. You're looking at, you know, forward movement, support, uh, getting in between the lines and ultimately, you know, as a, as a team in the mid block, trying to stop it. Um, I think when you so, so when you're looking at that hope and you're thinking about the mid block, what are the typical trends that you tend to come up against in respect of the way teams play against you in the mid block? Um, I, I think that the teams that um, sit sit clearly sorry somebody's coming into this room yeah sure okay sorry do you want to pose that still again i'm sorry warren yeah so sorry so sorry. when so when when you're in, that's okay that's okay so when you're in a mid block what are the typical trends that teams who are creating the attack would come up would you know would try and impose on yourself yeah as you say the, the, the teams and and i would say the better teams with no disrespect to anybody else and, and certainly this this the start of the this season we've played the, the top four teams bar one um so they definitely try to play through you try to play in between the lines um their midfield players playing higher up beyond our midfield players almost over like trying to overload our our back line um so that's been really challenging and and, and obviously the movement you know, in and around that midfield area, um, going beyond our midfield and then coming out and showing. So, so that's that's been quite a challenge to sort of negate the the movement and negate the opposition playing through us. Um, so, trying to almost set up right. They won't play through us. They might have to play round us, which you know, in effect, might buy us more time. So, would you say the biggest thing with that hope would be, you know? Uh, patience and discipline of, of your team yeah really you know start positions reshape very quickly um you know i i i say plug the plug the gaps plug the holes you know the distances have to be right you know if you're one step to the left too much and you're not enough one step to the right too much the best teams will play through you so yeah. we've really had to work hard on understanding you know, if teams switch the ball round, round, round the back, looking for that penetrative pass, we have to be equal to that. We have to cover the ground um, very, very quickly to try and plug those holes. And that, that's what we've been working on. And certainly, given the teams that we've played, you know, the top four, if you like, teams, that has been a real, real lesson in the opening games of this season. Brilliant. So just linking into that then, Hope, you, you mentioned you've played um, some of the top four teams this season. So if we were to look specifically at Man City and Everton as two examples from this season, can you can you talk us to look through a little bit how you see them slightly different? So how Everton might create the attack slightly different to Man City, for example? Um, well, well, we know and anybody that, that watched Man City know that, that they like to, um, you know, have a have a single pivot, if you like that likes to get on the ball and play through the thirds. Um, so Kira Walsh is, is the one that generally comes and shows to feet. They, you know, she's a bit of a playmaker. Um, so we had to manage that. And if, if they can play through you, they will. Equally, they've got, they've got pace on the outside. Um, so those centre-halves trying to switch the play to overload us on one side um, was, was quite evident. And I just think the pace in which 
Man City move the ball very quickly, uh, limited touches. I think I think we recognise that that you know player for player that they're probably going to have more possession. They're probably the caliber of player. Sometimes they're a lot quicker, so we have to adjust very quickly to their movement. To you know, when a, one player releases the ball, what, you know, what's the next movement? And we have to try and be clued onto that. I think with um, Everton, you know, they got pace down the sides, you know, a, a centre forward that scores for fun. But equally, they they will, a bit, a bit like Man City, you know, they'll play through the thirds if they can. And again, I think both of them have those midfield players that try and work beyond our midfield players. So a bit different, but similar, if you, if you like. And always there's the threat of the pace on the outside. So it, it's trying to contend with all of that at once, which, uh, you know, is, is challenging. And I, I think the fact that, that in those two particular games, we got a draw. Um, you know, if you look at the stats, our players have to work extremely hard for those draws, playing against two very, very good sides. I think it's really important the point you made around you might try and stop them from playing through you, but then if they go on the outside, that's also a really tricky problem to, to solve. Um, and yeah, we'll talk absolutely. a little bit more about that later on. Um, yeah. We're now going to look at the a video, actually, um, which just kind of brings to life what a mid-block actually is. Okay, so that's um, obviously a video around uh, our sort of 
principles of play uh, with the England DNA. And, you know, the typical things that you see, you know, is the, the point of when to press, how to delay, um, the cover around that, the balance around that, and obviously how to control how to control and restrain. Um, I mean, typically, most England teams you would find would be a high-pressing team. Uh, my experience with the under-19s, you know, from, from our start position, we'd always get after it. But more time than not, in transition, we'd find ourselves sitting ourselves in the mid-block. So after being in a high press, which may not have been successful, you're talking about reco all recovery runs or sprints. And then you're talking about the around, not through policy, uh, where we're just literally saying there's no way you're going to penetrate through us. We're going to force you around. And more time than not, that would be in a mid-block. So, you know, that's pretty much the England DNA uh, way. As you know, when, when you talk about terminology, uh, Hope, what terminology do you use and strategy do you use when we talk about mid-block? Yeah, I think um, for me, mid-block is a relatively new term, given all the years that I've been coaching. I, I just refer to it as the middle third. Yeah. Uh, and it is trying to defend that middle third so that the, the balls can't be played through you. Um, and I, as I say, directly down your throat. Um, and we, we you know, want to send them the long way round to try and buy some time um, to recover, to, to fill those holes, to to make sure we're nice and tight and compact. Um, so really trying to protect that middle third to stop them getting into the final third. So they're either going to have to go around you or over you, um, you know, and, and hopefully our, our goalkeeper has a high enough start position to kind of sweep that up. Um, and we, we've got not bad pace at the back. So quite often than not, we, you know, try and win that one, one v one race, if you like. Um, so very important for us that they don't go through us in that middle. Yeah. I mean, distances is really, really key, Hope, isn't it? When you talk about, you know, the line of engagement, yeah. depending on where, you know, exactly where that's going to start. And then the distances from front to back, really. I mean, you're looking at maybe, you know, 30 metres from, you know, your, your, your foot point, the first point of engagement to your deepest player. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, the, the possibilities of getting that wrong, you know, one ball over the top and they could be in. So, you know, distances are really, really key, aren't they? Yeah, and, and certainly against the, the, the two teams we're talking about today, the, and we know this, the fact that they're, they're going to have more possession of the ball generally than we are. So in order to do that for 90 minutes, run, fill the gaps, is really, really demanding. So at some point, you're going to get stretched. So it's not only physically are you, are you um, have the, the, the capacity to do that, but it's also mentally... You know, as fatigue starts to set in and you begin to tire mentally, you know, your reactions aren't the same. You, you don't make those decisions as quickly. And that is all part of the challenge. Um, how do you protect that, that area of the field when you are physically tired and mentally tired? You know, and that's about, you know, the team working for each other. That's when communication comes into play you know, the, the positive speak and all of those things that are equally as essential, as essential as the physical aspect of it. The mental aspect is crucial. Right. Brilliant. We actually Great. have some um, stats from this season and last season concerning Brighton's mid-block, as we can see here. Yeah. Um, and, and the way the FA had measured this was um, how many of the opposition's possessions actually get into um, a team's defensive third. I, that doesn't include set pieces. Um, so we can see there's already an improvement. So the lower the number, the better. Um, so what's your thoughts on these on these stats, Hope? Um, uh, yeah, I found them really interesting. I, I think um, certainly the, the, the Everton one, we, we, you know, felt we did really, really well. Um, I think it's aligned to the players having greater understanding of their role within that. Um, and I also think the fact that the players are, again, fitter than they were last season. So I think, I think you know, both of them are, are essential. And certainly against in Man City, it's come down by 1%. Um, again, a better understanding and, you know, fitter than they were last season, therefore able to cover that ground in order to prevent the opposition passing through us. Because in both, um, you know, the stats would suggest, and they're probably right, certainly Man City, their ball possession was far greater than ours. 
So we had to be really, really switched on and try and keep the play in front of us so that they couldn't play through us. And that takes a lot of work in terms of physical work and mental work, actually. Yeah, and there's been a lot of new additions to the WSL in terms of players from all over the world who've, yeah. who've made the league even even stronger. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so hopefully these numbers will continue to, to go down, hope. Yeah, well, that's the idea for us. But I think for us, it, it, it highlights the fact that, that players um, are responding to it. You know, they're, they're, our players certainly are playing against the world, world Cup winners, um, Olympic champion winners, and, and we are starting to perhaps edge a little bit more towards competing on a, on a regular basis with them. Yeah. So it's good for us. So now I guess we're going to try and uh, talk a little bit around sort of the when and why um, of using a mid-block or defending the middle third, as, as Hope would call it. Um, and we spoke earlier in the webinar, didn't we, around we're going to solve this problem, i.e. not let them play through us, but then that kind of results in another problem, which we have to deal with potentially out wide. So it's that ongoing probably conversation between both teams as they play around, here's, like, here's a problem, I've sol solved it, but now... A different problem has happened that we've got to try and solve and it's kind of like an ongoing yeah. uh, thing that's going on between the two teams so um yeah if we if we think back to um the city and everton games because they're the two clubs that we're really focusing on um can you can you think of there some situations where actually like your team weren't were, were having to press higher or drop deeper and i, I think the point of this is like it's a mid blocks one way of defending and it's not going to happen all of the time as you described because each strategy has its returns and trade-offs so how flexible was was your team can you recall in those games yeah i, I think it's really in, important that as, as a coach you 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 under well for me you understand look you, you don't want to spend the game defending you you have your moments in game so if, if you're defending in, in a mid block and you win win the ball, maybe the, the, the next part of your, your game plan is, is, you know, the transition, transition quickly to attack. So if you're in their defensive third and you've got bodies around the ball and the ball's turned over, you know, why would you suddenly drop off when you're close enough to engage, closer to their goal? If you win it, you're closer to their goal. So, you know... If you're not and they've got comfortable possession, then maybe that's the time when you go, okay, they've got comfortable possession, let us regroup, let's drop off and perhaps let's get a breath. Because, you know, high press for 90 minutes is unsustainable for any team, I think. And then certainly a, a mid block, if you want to, at some point, the idea is to get in their final third. And if you're in there and you're, you're close enough to engage, why wouldn't you engage? So it, it, it's when, really, it's when do you do it, when don't you do it, why do you do it, I'm close enough to the ball, I'm not close enough to the ball, then I'm going to maybe drop off a bit. So, and, and I think as a coach, it's really important that the players have the ownership of that sometimes, for me anyway, that they recognise, as part of their development, they recognise when it's okay and when it isn't okay. Yeah. Thanks, Hope. Warren, you've got a question as well, haven't you? Yeah, just, just a question. So just in various instances in both games, Hope, when you, you know, adapted the uh, the mid-block, you know, what, what things did you have to kind of solve and overcome as a result of that with both teams? Obviously, City um, I, I think one of the things is our eagerness to press, mm. you know, and players recognising. I have this, this, this phrase that... Are you pressing the ball or are you chasing the ball? Because there's a difference. If you're pressing for me means you, you can probably engage on their first, second touch. If you can't, then you are just chasing around like a headless chicken. And if you're doing that and, and the opposition, the calibre of opposition that you're up against, they will have the ability and the capacity to just play the ball around you and through you. And then you're ahead of the ball. And then that means we're a number, we're a number down in effect. And then that means that those 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 holes and those 
those gaps I talk about become unplugged. So for a player, it, it, for our players, sometimes it is their enthusiasm and recognising when you can engage and when you can't engage. And when you can't engage is the time perhaps that you need to play with your head, you know, sit off, reshape, go to that mid block and make it as difficult as possible for them to play through you. And I suppose, you know, with that, I suppose leaders in the team who are quite vocal can help control certain individuals who might be really eager to go. It's like, you know, keep your shape, be patient. You know, that's that's equally as important as, as, as anything else, isn't it, really? Yeah, and, and even that I spend my life, like, you know, on the sideline trying to encourage, but, you know, don't go, sometimes, I mean, don't go, you know, you can see it, their enthusiasm wants to, you know, they're so committed. Sometimes it's, you know, don't go. And, and at those moments, if you haven't had much of the ball, it's a chance for you to get your breath back. Yeah. It's hard work. Mm. Hard work. I was just thinking back to the, the City game and um, City created a few chances. Um, yeah, they, created they created a few chances. Um, but I remember you saying, well, um, you know, luckily for, for, luckily for us, they didn't necessarily finish like some of those chances on that day and I was reflecting on that and you know is it luckily for us or actually did you did you turn it on its head a little bit and cause them some really like difficult problems to solve you know I, I, I think what we did well we, we competed you, you know they they created chances um, our goalkeeper on the day was outstanding um, we made it difficult we made it difficult by um, you know, trying to stop their game plan. You know, this is the way we think they're going to play and this is what we're going to do to counter that. And I think on, on the day, everybody played their part. So, yes, we did make it difficult. And I think the, you know, if you, as a coach, if you recognise that perhaps you're not going to have as much of the ball and they are and they've got a certain way of playing, how do you, how do you nullify what they they are comfortable with doing. How do you how do you gain some advantage from making it difficult for them when they are so comfortable in playing this particular way? Um, and I think against Man City, we, we we did that well. And the longer the game goes on, the more the more you believe in what you're doing, the more confidence you get, um, and the more you then go, oh, you know, you're going to get a moment. You will get a moment in the game. And that's why I guess one of my principles is always be hard to beat. Be hard to beat because if you're in it, you know, you will get a moment. And then it's at the other end, it's now it's about taking those moments. Yeah. Which, you know, I, th I think, you, you know, we, we didn't score against Men City, but we created chances. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll look specifically at the, at the Man City game then. So here's a reminder of, of the lineups to start with. And um, just kind of, just would like you hope if you can, just to recall some context behind this game, um, which which you thought to be important in that moment in time. Um, and also, what was the goal? What was what was your team ultimately trying to achieve in this game? And what were the challenges as well that you, you thought would probably be presented? Yeah, well, well, make no mistake, we go into the game going, you know, right, we're, we're, we're going to win this game. We want to win this game. We, we understand the realities of it. Um, but it is about player to player. We're not playing against the bad, we're playing against the person. Let's go player, you know, come up against the player, give it your best, because you will have a moment in the game. I think we, we recognise ultimately that they would have more possession of the ball, as, as I said, um, we recognise that, you know, they like to play out through the back, play through the thirds. How, how can we nullify their sweet spots, if you like? You know, how can we, we deny them the opportunity to play through their sweet spots um, and have a strategy set to counter that? Um, and that's basically what, what we focused on. We know they like to play through us. They also have the ability to play that diagonal ball behind us or you know so we had to come up with a strategy to stop that yeah um, we thought on the day we we you know i'm not saying they created a lot of chances but not as many as perhaps clear cut as they would have liked 
yeah yeah so let, let's have a look at the at the clip we found then we'll have a look first of all um it'll be normal speed um and then we'll look at slow-mo I'm so sorry. No worries. Um, Hope, talk us through what you're seeing. seeing yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we, I think the important thing to force them back is what we're trying to do. Um, you, you think, I think that's an essay, thinking that there's perhaps a moment and then recognising there isn't. Um, and then just trying to keep them playing in front of us as, as much as possible and knowing that, that at some point they're going to play through you and making sure if you stop there, knowing that, that they, if we press from behind and in front, there's every opportunity to crowd them out, but very quickly just trying to reshape. So that's gone into, I think, that they're centre forward, stand way at the time. If we try and crowd her out, and then as that ball's released, just try and reshape into that middle third. Stop there. You stop there. So long as we're in shape, you've got half a chance of, of you know, being first to the ball or making it very difficult for them. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, can we press? No, they keep it. Can we reshape? The ball moves. Can we move? Can we press? They get it. Can we reshape? So it, it's the next job. It's always the what next, the what next. And then obviously we, we win it and, and it's just trying to be a little bit more composed on the ball. You know, we do well and then ultimately again we, we, we give them the ball. And, that, and now it's again, can we force them back? Is there a moment? So Anessa's thinking, is there a moment? And I've got to make a decision here to try and force them one way doesn't do that very well, but then it's the next player that feels in behind that. And if you stop there, and then it's almost our second centre forward having the awareness that if you don't drop back behind the ball, you will get played through. Mm. It's really important. Get back behind the ball so that it's difficult for them to pass through your middle third. And then just trying to slow it down. I think it forces them to try now and go round us. So if you if you see here a number 15 on the left, um, Kaylee Green, I think it is, if you, if you play that forward slightly, she's in two minds, shall I, shan't I, and just decides to hold her run. So now regrouping, our midfield trying to get across, our centre forwards coming behind the ball to make it very difficult for them to try and play through. And for us, it's really hard work, really hard work. But trying to get players behind the ball to protect that middle, I think this is the bit where Kaylee Green on the left side decides not to go if you stop there because she recognises the threat on her outside. Now, that, that for me is the difference between chasing and pressing. So I think she's realised if I, if I go for this, I'm nowhere near it. And if I go for it, I leave a big gap on my outside. Now we're in a position where we can, can affect the player on the ball and we end up ultimately stopping them getting into our final third. So I think the, 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 key, the key is, can you force them to play backwards? Um, if the ball goes beyond me, what's my, my second job? You know, I'm not out of the game. I'm still firmly in it. I have to get behind the ball. 
get numbers behind the ball to make it difficult for them to play through us. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Hope. That was a really interesting insight. And um, I really liked the what you noted about Kaylee Green. Yeah. Um, it's, it's probably something that you've, I'm, I'm assuming you've worked loads with, with players on around. Yeah, I, th I think she's naturally blessed with pace. So, you know, in her head, which is great, it's a great asset. Um, she can win it. She can win it. But when, when you're up against players that move the ball very quickly in one and two touch, by the time you've, you've decided to press, the ball's already gone. And yeah. so very quickly you're out of the game. So I think for players just to recognise when you can and when you can't is really important. And then when do I have to protect that mid third and apply a mid block? And in halfway through that clip, Brighton won the ball back. Um, I think they had a, a few passes before they then lost the ball again. So kind of it, it kind of shows, doesn't it, the importance you were saying before around having a plan when we do get it back um, from yeah. that type of position. And actually, it's really hard, probably really hard to then be able to maintain and or or penetrate quickly. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, it's working out when you can and when you can't. What you know, yeah. it, it's about choosing your moments to, to go forward. Is it realistic or is it you know a bit of calm needs to be applied? And sometimes yeah. just to get your breath back. You know, it's far harder when you haven't got the ball than it is. You know, we've all played. When you've got it, it's easy, isn't it? You've, you're full of life. When you haven't got it, it's like you are tired very quickly. So it's just recognising those moments, I think. Especially against a team like City, right, who if they lose the ball in that type of area will probably just press you straight away really quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so um, we're now going to move on to the Everton game. So similar, I guess, to the last the last con uh, question around context. What... What kind of stands out in your head? Because this was only a few weeks ago. So what was the context around this game and what were the challenges you were expecting it to present? Um, well, well, we, we know they have pace in wide areas, but, but, but you know, not dissimilar to, to Man City, actually. Um, we know they have pace in wide areas, but we also recognise that they've got uh, highly technical players um, that can pass through you, beyond you, round you. Uh, and in particular, they, they have a player that likes to sit between the lines, between the back line and our midfield line, so and stay there. You know, very rarely come out and stay there. So I think for, for our, certainly our mid block, it's recognising that, you, you know, you have to deal with the space in front of you as well as the space behind you, especially if they push an additional player onto our back line. Um, so that was quite noticeable. And, and, you know, again, having to be really disciplined in trying to plug those holes in that midfield area. Pace out wide, knowing that they've got pace out wide, but knowing if we know where we're, they're going to play it, it gives us a chance to come around a bit quicker. So we try, try to make it as predictable as we could for us in order for our start position to be set at the right moment and at the right time. Yeah, because um, Everton have scored a lot more goals this season than uh, previous seasons. They seem a lot more threatening. But then in this game, actually, the two goals they scored were from set pieces, if I remember right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I think that their first goal, White wasn't given as an own goal. You, you know, it's a free kick, came off our player's head and flew in. And obviously, um, their new centre forward, Guvan, who is excellent in the air. I mean, it was a, a, a great header. has been their ultimate threat. So, you know, good for them. Got a great sign in in somebody that can score goals. So let's have a look at the clip we've got from this game. So again, we'll go normal speed to start with. So maybe if you people watching, have, have a look at um, what Everton are doing in, in relation to what Hope, what Hope spoke about. Okay, so going slow-mo, Hope, if you just talk us through what you're seeing. 
Yeah, I think I think this is where we started a little bit higher up, actually, and then obviously they get the ball, and again trying to get bodies behind the ball. And if you just just noticed uh, notice here, it goes back. Um, Lee, this player, our number nine, is generally our centre forward. So it's just about can we plug the gaps in line with the ball, give myself a chance. So even if it goes over me, I've got a chance of affecting the first touch. Um, and just forcing them back again. She works really hard. Not her strength Lee, by any means, but works really hard. And again, she's, she's deciding not to chase, reshape, let them have it at the back. And just this is now the time where you go, right, this is an opportunity perhaps for us to breathe. And again, not, not going, making them force the, the longer ball. It gives us a chance to have a really good start, pos start position in our back four. And if you notice our midfield, as the ball is travelling, is also travelling. So those gaps and those distances, Warren, that you spoke about, you know, mm -hmm. making sure that those gaps aren't too big. If you look at our midfield there in relation to our back line, mm -hmm. they're following it and it reduces those gaps in between. Yeah, totally. So having to go over us, uh, our back line, good start the position, midfield following so that any drop down, they're at least in contention. Fantastic. Okay, thanks, Hope, for your for your insight into those clips. Um, I think it really brings to life all of the stuff you've already spoken about um, so far in the webinar. Um, so we're just going to move on to uh, the next part, the next slide. So you've actually alluded to this throughout, um, Hope. I think you even said it in the first or second slide, but this idea of being flexible, um, as a team and knowing I guess the, the toughest decision is sometimes for the players is just making taking responsibility for a decision in terms of whether to press higher uh, whether to get back behind the ball as you described and actually um, try to affect it in that way um, so we actually have a clip um, from the Everton game because it was a bit of a thriller to be fair that game um, it was end to end yeah, lots, of, lots of stuff going on in that game so um We've got a really good clip, I think, which brings to life um, the messages you've already shared around being flexible. So on the attack. Is this coming again in slow motion? I hope so. Yeah, yeah, it will be. And you're actually pressing a little bit higher and a little bit more, bit more aggressively than you have done in previous clips. Um, 78 minutes, just yeah. gone to one down. Win a throw on, and then there's a double substitution made by Everton, and then the throw on's taken. Yeah, and it leads to... Yeah. <laughs> so just before we see it in slow motion, um, we spoke before and you were saying, actually, you know what, like coming into this game, there was a strong belief um, we, we can win it. And actually, you could see that from from the attitude and the, the behaviours of the player on the pitch, players on the pitch as they as they um, when it was 1-1, you wanted the next goal. You know, when it's 2-1 down, we want to get the next mm. goal. Um, that was definitely coming out in terms of how you were operating out of possession. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the belief, I mean, even when it was 2-2, two, two, there was a strong, yeah. strong belief um, that we could win it. And now, you, you know, we've got bodies forward, we're losing. You, you know, we're trying to get ourselves back in the game. And I think now when the ball's turned over, Metro is in transition to defend. If you stop there... In the middle of the park, that I can't remember what number she's got on, but Rianne Jarrett, Jarrett is actually our our centre forward, and she's now doing that midfield, you know, recovery run, filling the, the holes in between, tracking their runners, um, and this is something that that 
try and get the the players you know you're not you might wear the number nine shirt but it doesn't mean to say that you won't end up in the middle of the park having to defend um and i think in this game we we, we did that particularly well so that transition and trying again to get behind the ball track runners and and plug the holes uh yeah. she does really well here players working hard to get behind the ball again um because we want to win the ball back and then I think as it as it goes, and obviously they they're trying to slow the play down. Um, we're then a little bit higher, and here Kaylee Green. If you just see that she checks her shoulder, yeah, and knowing that if she addresses the ball right, then that ball's not going to be played round her. Um, but we're trying to win the ball back and get in, into the game. And again, pressing higher up. You know, if I try and force her one way. She can't play through us, and then it goes again, and then she decides to come back and, and plug those holes. And I think really, I, I think this is where the players did really well in owning it. And then now recognising a situation where we might be able to box them in, um, and everybody getting closer, the midfielder higher up, you know, and I think here we win it because the press is higher. And I think from this point, it, it gives us a real opportunity and we end up we end up drawing. And yeah. the, the ball that was played in, that's our left back who put that ball across. Brilliant. We were on the front. You, sorry, sorry yeah. Warren? No, no. just say, when you, when, you, when you look at the clips, you can kind of tell the players are sensing there's something here and they're believing it. And as they're, the more they're believing it, the higher they're going and they're looking to press and they're on their front foot. Uh, even with a throw on, you win, you know, they've done brilliant to win it back. But they want to get it back into play because they kind of feel that Everton are vulnerable, yeah. and they've you, know, they've, they've you know they've sensed it. But the players have it's since the players have done that themselves, haven't they? They've yeah. recognised it. I think as you get a, you're in the game, you can feel it, can't you? We've all been mm. and feel when you've got that momentum, and it 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 seems to be going in in your favour, and actually it is. And then I think you know even when we won the gap, sorry, when it was two two and we scored. It's about, I think I said to you, Amy, there was like two minutes to go, and I'm like, okay, we've done well. The draw is good. You know, get it in the corner. And, and two of the players came up to me, no hope, we think we can win it. And I'm like, okay. And I really love that. I mean, it's them owning it and, and believing that the, they've got the ability to win the game. That's really important. So over to you, Gar. You know, I think it's really important. They're the ones that are on the pitch. They can feel it more than you. And if they believe in it enough, they'll try and deliver it. So uh, moving on to the the next part, which which I guess is more around uh, you hope your coaching practice hope and you know like what you've described there about your players. H how what do you do with players in the build up to games really? Um, so and I hope you've got a question to start. Uh, sorry, Warren, you've got a question for hope to start this one off, haven't you? Yeah, sorry, no, it's just the same same sort of thing really. I mean, you're building up. You've got a you've got a, you've got an informed team on the weekend. Um, what does you what does it what will a typical week look like when you're really looking at sort of homing in on detail? Um, so you know, we, we you know, for instance, you know, types of practices, how much analysis you do. You know, can you give us a snapshot of what a build-up week would look like? Yeah, I, I, I am a bit of a detail coach. I, I do like the detail, um, and I think it's important for learning that that, that you understand what you're up against. Um, so we, we do a lot of work around um, what the opposition do in possession, what they do out of possession. So try and highlight where they might be vulnerable, um, definitely highlight their strengths and how we're going to counter that. So we do a lot of video analysis. Um, I encourage the players to, to do their homework, you know, watch games, you know, watch the games, watch the opponent that you might be up against. And then we, we, try and put it into practice on the pitch. Um, you know, the out of possession stuff, what do they look like in possession? What are we going to do out of possession? Um, you know, it's like quite often, you know, the players just want to play. And I'm like, look, we have to get the detail right. So there's always a little bit of a ding dong, if you like, around that, a healthy ding dong. Um, as much as they want to play, they do ask a lot of questions. So, which is great, which is yeah. fantastic. Um, and then we just just try and um, go through and rehearse, you know, between the thirds, you know, their defensive third. What are we going to do, you know, in the midfield? What are we going to do? 
back for what are we going to do and put the detail on the players. This is what this player will do. This is what you have to consider. And always, as I said before, asking them if they're comfortable with it. Are you comfortable with it? Does this feel good to you? And allow them to engage in the conversation. Um, and then obviously do it when we've got possession, try and highlight their vulnerabilities. And this is what we could do. You know, and that, and that final third, when we're in that final third, I really just try and encourage them to play with, with freedom, freedom and fun. Go and, you know, express yourself. Um, but make sure we've got support around the, you know, the ball's out wide and there's an opportunity to live, to deliver, you know, get bodies in the box, break your neck to get in the box. You know, if they can't deliver, get, get bodies around the ball, support the player on the ball. Yeah. What about, what about from a psych point of view? You know, there might be a message throughout the week, you know, as I said, you're playing an informed team, you may dominate possession. What potentially might that psych message, you know, look like? or, or so? Uh, like? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, I've got this really, this big thing about, you know, you're playing against the person, not the badge. You know, you know, go go one-to-one or toe-to-toe with this person and, and try and win that, you know, that battle. And then it, it's about, you know, everybody doing it together. You know, if everybody does it, we've got a better chance. And it, that, that togetherness really... Yeah. Um, and we're fortunate we have a, a I have a full time psychologist that that's doing some fabulous work around that sort of together yeah. and you know having a bit of belief in in your ability and taking pride in what you do. So Brilliant. thinking back then to the Everton game, hope um, yeah. sort of building on that psych message and and the prep that you might typically do. What, what was the what did that look like? Was it a typical? sort of build up to it, like how you would do with other with other teams or was there some slight uh, differences in that particular week? Um, there, there are not really too many differences. Your structure's the, the same, although I did offload them, to, to, to be honest, a lot more, which, which the, the players were, you know, I need to do a bit more and, you know, well, you know, let, let's just be fresh because I think when you've got a five-hour journey, you know, it's a long way. There's a lot to deal with just travelling up, mm. going up to Everton. So, you know, we've had several games. We've worked quite hard. You know, a little bit of less loading. Um, did that make any difference? Probably, probably not. I just think I think the players felt good. They just had a good feeling. And I think as, as players, you quite often know that. You know, the staff have a good feeling. And, and if you've done all the preparation right and you've, you've, you've focused on the detail, they're aware of all their players. We've given them, you know, all the information we can. I encourage the players to do their homework, do your own homework on the player. You know, they stronger on their left foot, their right foot. You know, they must take some ownership of it. Um, and I think that's how we went into the game. And, and, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You described yourself as a detail coach. Um, and, and it's really important for you to be able to share that detail with the players. And um, so, so when you're coaching out of possession concepts, do you see any differences in your coaching behaviours? Um, or Not just you, but the whole coaching team. Is that deliberate as well? When we're out of possession? Yeah, when you're coaching out of possession yeah. concepts. I think it's really, for, for me, understanding the strengths of the opposition and really highlighting, you know, where if you don't do this or make that movement or do that run, you will you will get played through. If, you, if your body shape is wrong, you know, you won't win the race. If you, if you don't, you know, check your shoulders and keep checking your shoulders and, you, you know... A, a, a player's going to pop out and you won't see, you know, that it's all of those just, just, you know, gentle reminders of the details and, and you, you know, sort of the calibre you're up against. This player yeah. can do that. They won't take two touches, they'll take one, you know. So you've got to be mindful that you don't go charging out, that you might have to decelerate, you might have to hold your ground. Um, so just giving them that sort of information and then trying to apply it in practice so that it ends up in their muscle memory. So when it comes to the game, they can do it automatically. 
it's like a, it sounds like you would highlight the consequences so like when we haven't got the ball if you don't do this like this is probably going to happen and being really explicit have to and obvious i guess with, with yeah. That. yeah 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 i think, I think the pace of the game is so much quicker um and there's a lot to consider and you, you know you, you have to have the capacity in your mind to make those decisions very very quickly and that's what i say the best players can make those decisions very very quickly yeah and that's what we're striving for yeah so you know get used to dealing and managing that detail so that it becomes automatic yeah amazing okay um so hope if you could um just last few minutes now if you could just summarize um some key messages for the coaches listening in terms of the mid block defending the middle third out of possession what, what's what's really important uh, for you in this in this space um i think no i think number one no no your opposition you know um and the key players that, that want to penetrate and play through the thirds know what they're going to do and then your, your plan um your strategy i think get the buy-in from the players uh have them challenge, challenge your thinking, you know, and don't be afraid to, you know, if you think that what they're saying sounds right and, and, and feasible, don't be afraid to change your plan. But everybody's got to be on task. Um, and then I think, you know, practice it, run through it, do a dress rehearsal so that everybody absolutely knows what their role and their responsibility is. Um, so that you can check and challenge and make sure they have an understanding. Yeah. And hopefully they apply it, you know, in the game and it and it works. Yeah. Warren, did you want to add anything to that? No, just, I mean, hope pretty much covered it. I mean, you know, you're looking at an organised team, aren't you, in a, in a shape, uh, being patient, being disciplined, denying space, frustrating the opposition. And the longer you can do that, the more hope and belief that you can have to, to go on and potentially win the game. And the players can believe more. So, you know, it's got to be organised and structured. It's not sort of very much, it's not gung-ho. Um, yes, there is transition moments and a little bit risk and reward. But again, the players may sense that moment, similar to what happened against the Everton game, when to do it, when not to. Um, and just recovering back into shape to become a solid team unit and individual again. Okay, cool. So I guess for the coaches listening, um, just I guess everything we always do is just in relation to your context with the players that you've got, which is exactly what Hope was talking about today, like with the players that she's got, um, finding a, a way to to overcome the problems and to set problems for the opposition. So um, just the, the three words on the screen here, just some uh, prompts for the coaches listening. Is there something you've heard today which confirms what you already believe to be true? Um, about the mid block and coaching the mid block or defending. Um, is there something that challenged your thinking today um, in this space? Or maybe there's something that you you thought was quite interesting uh, that made you curious, which you'd like to find out some more stuff about. So th that's it from us. I just want to like massively thank you, Hope, for, for spending the time with us today to chat about um, your out of possession um, stuff with Brighton. It's obviously it's a real privilege for us all to be able to to have that conversation and listening on that conversation but thank you yeah thanks Hope. thank you my pleasure my pleasure thank you